All right. So everyone, welcome. This month's um, forum is around trauma-informed teaching. And it does say part one, because yes, you guessed it, November is part two. So today we're going to be going through a lot of information. Hopefully we will be able to see your smiling faces as we go through. So if you're able, we would love for you to have your video on. Make sure you have a few pieces of blank paper. We are not going to do breakout rooms today because of the content. So we are just going to stay as a large group and share and connect that way. Um, just keep your mute microphone muted and do your Zoom. We're all pretty used to it now. I'm Donna Trujillo. I'm the Vice President of Tiered Services and Special, Opera Special Populations for Generation Schools Network. I have been a director of the third largest district in Colorado for special education. I'm also, I've also been with Generation Schools now for a little over four years. And hi, everybody. I'm Zach Kess. I'm a senior director with Generation Schools Network. And uh, before I landed here, I was, I was a director. I was actually with Donna in the big school district. I was a director of health, wellness, and prevention. So my world is, is all about getting out in front of some of this stuff and, and giving you that information. Thanks, Zach. Hi, everyone. I'm CJ Roberts. I'm a director for Generation Schools Network. I'm also the director of our social emotional learning curriculum, Empowering Education. Um, and I'm just really happy to be here. I'll just be running some of the tech stuff. So here's our agenda today. We're going to do some introductions and warm up. Our outcomes will give you an overview of trauma and the ACE, the adverse childhood experiences. You're going to learn a lot of information about neural development, which also helps you learn about yourself too. Resilience, we all know that's important. We'll give you some strategies and we'll have time for a Q&A. So remember, we are going to do amazing work together to bring awareness, hope, and empowerment for addressing life's challenges. Here are our outcomes. Since it's part one, we want to establish a foundation of knowledge to understand how complex trauma really is, why you may be seeing negative outcomes or behaviors from those that you work with, and most importantly of all, how do we become trauma responsive? To start out this work, everybody, we, uh, we know that you're going to learn some things today that might bring up some past trauma, so to recognize that. Um, that this might be very difficult if you need to come off screen or do something like that or leave, that we, we understand. Um, you might feel and learn some things today that bring up feel, uh, feelings of guilt, anger, resentment, or helplessness. So really want us to set our intentions of our time together because this is really work. And when we're doing this work, we have to have a lot of grace for ourselves and others. So let's try to set that attention, intention. To start off, though, uh, I want us just to get us centered around this work and around grace uh, for ourselves. Set your intention and let's do five mindful breaths, just deep breaths, full breathing in your nose, out your mouth uh, five times. So if you can sit, if you're sitting, just sit up in a nice, comfortable space. You can look down or you can close your eyes, however you feel comfortable. And just on your own, just go ahead and engage in five deep breaths and then we'll get started. Okay. That kind of an activity is always a good one to demonstrate and model for our students and for anybody else, if we're engaging in this work, to give them a little strat strategy of bringing us back to our present. All right. Let's talk a little bit. We want to get a, a, a good uh, idea of where you're at. So in the chat, if you would, a one, two, or three here for, for each one. 
Um, what is your current level of understanding around adverse childhood experiences? And remember, this is a trauma one kind of our introduction class, so that's fine. We expect some of but but a one, two, or three. Where are you at for understanding around adverse childhood experiences? Aces. Ones and twos looks like they're most prevalent, Zach. Perfect. All right. What about what it means to be tra trauma-informed and trauma-responsive? Where's your level of experience there? One, two, or three? One a little, three, I could teach it. Ones, twos, a couple of threes. Oh, nice. All right. Well, this will be a review for you threes. Brain or development. When we're, when we're sharing, share out, right? Please. Yes, please share. Too. We all, there's so much knowledge out there about this. Yeah. So when we do share outs, please. Brain development. Where are you at with brain development? One, two, three. Kind of understanding childhood brain neurodevelopment. One, three, the rest ones and twos. All right. And then our last one, universal supports for students impacted by adverse childhood experiences. So these are things be the things you would see in a classroom. Universal supports that would be for everybody. More ones and twos, more twos on this one, Zach, and a three. Nice. Okay, good. All right. Well, if you're a three in this, please, again, when we're there, please share. And hopefully ones and twos, this really is geared towards, it, towards you. And hopefully you're getting a lot out of this. All right. First thing we need to talk about is this statement right here. Trauma is measured by impact, not the event. This is very, very important to come out the gate and understand because as we talk about these things and we dig into adverse childhood experiences, um, sometimes we might have um, this you know, this, our own perspective and hearing something that someone's got, that someone has gone through that we would consider an adverse childhood experience and be like, well, I, I went through that. Like that wasn't that bad. Like um, I was fine. Right. Be because the event is not what the important thing is. There's so much that determines um, whether something is around that something was impactful in the way of, of being traumatic. Right. Um, and a lot of things. So it could be the age at which this this happened, this, this, this experience happened because there's different developmental stages in brain development, but it affects different parts of our brain. And so a certain event, right. Um, at, at one age might be nothing, but at a, a different age could be something impactful. Genetics have a big role. Um, we know a lot now about work around epigenetics, which is meaning the turning on and off of genes. We know there's generational trauma, which means, um, Genes are actually those epigenetics. They're changed from generations prior that have undergone some significant adverse experiences, and that has changed the genetics of of further generations. Um, we know that, so that's that's something to always think about. Just your disposition as a person, like how you react, your reactivity, um, how you um, react to things. Um, people, a lot of people talk about like emotional superpowers. I always refer to my daughters. Uh, she's a, a, a young lady with emotional superpowers. She feels everything very intensely. So that will matter. Um, your family history, your community his, history, and the level of supports during that event, right? So one event when you have a lot of positive adults in you could be something you could you can overcome. That same event for someone that didn't have a positive influence as adults, um, also on top of it, a scary community or something was going on there will have a, a, a much bigger impact. Okay. So just really be careful. Um, you know, my, my trauma is not yours. Yours isn't mine. We all have our unique experiences. So just, just understand, um, that it's, it's by the impact uh, that it had on someone. Okay. All right. Next, let's talk about this very pivotal study around adverse childhood experiences. So those of you had didn't have a lot of experience uh, understanding this, a lot of this work and really an understanding of adverse childhood experiences came out of this, this ACES study by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC. This was back in 1995 and 1997, so a ways back now. 
what they did is they did survey um, data from seven about 17,500, a little over that, mostly white, mostly college edu educated, middle income, uh, and they were Kaiser HMO members from Southern California. So giving you this perspective, this is what they, and they studied and they asked these questions about their experience of from birth or earliest memory or what they can remember or know from to 18 years of age. And that's what they did. They did this. And then they tracked where these, where these folks were, these 17,500 plus people and what, you know, what kind of uh, events, what kind of things happened in their life, uh, medical, mental health, all these kind of things. They asked those, these questions that are down there in that uh, picture. They asked them about a physical abuse, emotional, sexual abuse. They asked about neglect. They asked about some of these other household dysfunctions. So these are the questions they asked them. These are what they are at this time were qualifying as adverse childhood experiences. Okay. What they, what they found was very profound. Now this, this, there are so many now great studies around this that even expand on this. Um, there's um, uh, Dr. Harris does an awesome TED talk. If you look this up, which is an amazing TED talk uh, that I would recommend for anybody just getting into this work. But here's what they found. They found that through the progression of this, these people's lives, um, that these adverse high, uh, childhood experiences then led into disrupted neurodevelopment. We'll get a little bit more into that. But what happened is it changed the way their brain developed at those sensitive times in those developmental periods in a, in a child's life. Remember, birth to 18. Okay, and that's something to think about because we know in, in neurodevelopment that our frontal lobe, at this time they didn't know that, but our frontal lobe is not fully developed to around to age 25, 26, right? Um, you know, my wife might say that men don't get there till 40, but that's not fair, I don't think. Anyway, so we got this disrupted neurodevelopment. Social emotional, then that then inhibits the social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, Right. Because of that impairment, there was a, an increase of adoption of health risk behaviors, right? Risk, seeking out risky behaviors, risky sexual behaviors, drugs, alcohol, all these kind of things, right? That obviously can impact life potential. Well, there's a lot of things that that will impact when you engage in those risk taking activities. This then led to disease, disability, and social prob uh, problems. And then in this study, early death. And what they found in this study is actually those people in that study that had, that had adverse childhood experience, especially four or more was what their study found. They actually died 25 years earlier than someone without those adverse childhood experiences. That's pretty profound. 25 years, right? Okay. So that's what that, that's what the Kaiser Permanente CDC study in 95, 97 with those 17, five, that's what they came up with. What questions are left unanswered? What doesn't this study tell us? Anybody, just kind of un unmute for a second. I'll take a couple. But when you look at the demographics of the study and you, you think of the study, what, what are some questions you might have? If you don't want to unmute, you could put it in the chat too, if you want. I guess the question would be how valid are uh, the results if they only used a very particular demographic? Right. Well, it, even, for, I mean, for that demographic, the, the results were pretty, I mean, they were validated for sure research-based, but to your point, it was, right, it was one part, one, one demographic. What else? Any other questions? The things that they didn't, they, that are, maybe this study doesn't tell us. What, what if, if someone, oh, go ahead. Just what about those who had adverse experiences, but whose outcomes were different? Did the study or are there studies that show that? So what would contribute to mitigating some of the effects of the adverse experiences? Yeah, love that. Yeah, because this wasn't about that, right? This study was about what were, they were just mapping out those things, right? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Nice. Were you saying something, Donna? I was just going to read her comment that she had. Oh, made. that's what she wrote. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, sorry, I'm going back. 
So yeah, some of the things they left out, what this study did not talk about was cumulative effects. So if you like having number and number on top and then more than one, so maybe you were abused once, but it doesn't, what, what's the difference if it was twice or just every day it was right. It didn't, it didn't talk about that. It just asked the question, were you right? So it didn't look at cumulative effects. Um, it didn't talk about any other sources of toxic stress, just those adverse childhood experiences. So to your point, it didn't look at what was going on in the community, what was going on in their family necessary. If there were other positive supports or lack or even worse, it didn't really go into that. So it had a very narrow, obviously you said demographics. So even with those limitations, it was still an incredibly valuable study that really launched this work and got it out there to everybody to start thinking about and, and I'm looking at. And so it's an important one to know when you start engaging in this work that you could say, yeah, I understand there was a study and all those things that happened, right? All these things that happen in this progression from even that demographic. So imagine when there's all these other things, right? Now we know that there's these different, different realms of adverse childhood experiences. We know that those, those things that, that are happened that were primarily what they were saying was in the household and even more there, right? So there's even some more things there. They didn't talk about homelessness. They didn't talk about bullying. Um, some of those things, right? Then they didn't look at the community effect, which is huge. And we know that now and, and more research is now just taken off, right? Branched off of that original one. We know that the community, we know things like dim, uh, discrimination and violence, historical trauma, substandard schools, right? Structural racism, poor water and air quality, lack of job, like all those things have a profound effect and are also adverse childhood experience. If you were a child with, you know, and your brain is still developing, you know, dealing with those will change how the brain develops. And then the environment, they didn't think about any of those things, right? The pandemic is huge. Everybody now, <laughs> all children have had at least one adverse childhood experience in their life. And that was the pandemic. That was quite the experience. Now, again, impact, not the event, right? So it might not, but it was an event. Might not have impacted everybody, but it definitely wasn't an event and it possibly could have. But all kinds of things, your house burns down, you have to go through a tornado, there's earthquake, like all these things, okay? So when we dig into this discussion a little bit more, well, I wanna frame this a little bit more about the, and to be informed, right? As we build our foundation in this work is the four R's of trauma-informed care. First, we want to realize, and we're going to go through this, you want to realize the widespread uh, widespread impact because it's a lot more perverse than I think most people think. There is a lot more. There's a big impact of trauma. We need to start recognizing, you need to understand the signs and symptoms, right? About what that looks like for someone that may, may be impacted by those events and had traumatic uh, events. We want to learn how to respond and not react. This is really important as we start to become more trauma-informed. And that's understanding this stuff. We'll get into a little bit about, about that. And then obviously we want to resist re-traumatization. I don't, I think that's one of the one of the most important things that we think about um, is that we want to start engaging in work, especially as educators, especially working with youth, that we aren't re we aren't re-traumatizing. And this is difficult because. Oftentimes, I, I know in my classroom, when I had a classroom, I wasn't quizzing kids, hey, I want to just give you a quick adverse childhood experiences quiz here and see how many ACEs you went through or are going, currently going through. We don't do that. And so you don't know, right? So that's why as a prevention guy, I'm thinking of the universal strategies. I want to do things in my classroom that are, because there are absolutely everybody here that is an educator has students in their classroom that have been impacted by adverse childhood experiences. We just don't know. And some of them you definitely know, but we don't know on some, right? Um, because they don't present that way. And so we want to do practices. We want to have practices um, where we aren't, where we're not re-traumatizing. All right. So let's realize this widespread impact. Let's look at some of this data. Okay. This is, this is some 61% of adults had at least one ACE and 16% had four or more types of ACEs. And that might be you. When I look at my childhood and I started digging into this work, I had four plus adverse childhood experiences in my, in my growing up. 
Now, there are some things that didn't create as big an impact because there were some other protective factors in place. But if I go through the list, so definitely one of the 16%. Females in several racial ethnic minority groups were at greater risk for experiencing four or more. And that's when we really start to see a disruption in neural development at four or more. Many people do not even realize it. And that there is an increased risk for health problems. That's what Dr. Harris says, uh, Burke Harris, Dr. Burke Harris, if you want to listen to a TED talk, she's a physician. And that's what she talked about, right? That's what her whole, this epiphany she had is like, oh my God, these things that are happening to my kids that when I do, when I try to get to the root cause of why all these kids have asthma, why all these kids have, she could get that down to the adverse childhood experience. It affects our body systems um, and our, and our health. Okay. And, and we're going to go a little bit more into that. So if we look at this and we look at a, of, of the increased probability of these things, depression, hopelessness, suicide attempt, drug use, alcohol, look at all of those and look at the increase of when exposed to adverse childhood experience. So people that have had children that have had these adverse childhood experiences in their life, they will have, this is just what the data says, this higher percentage of probability for that. That's, that's pretty, I mean, not good. We don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think we like seeing those numbers, right? That's pretty impactful. When you start thinking about looking at root cause and what can we do for a lot of health risks, right? If we got rid of ACEs, if we could reduce ACEs and add those adverse childhoods, if we could get out in front of it for kiddos, then this is what it decreases these. So we could see that a decrease in these problems by that percentage alone. That's pretty impactful also. I mean, look at that cancer, cardiovascular disease. Pretty amazing. This is tied to their immune system. All these things in this part of this neural development, we'll go into a little bit around that and why, but, but it's a huge, huge impact. Okay. There's going to be a bunch of slides that I'm going to go through really fast. And, and I want you to just kind of look. I mean, we could spend a lot of time digging into it if you guys want to be epidemiologists right now, but that's not the point of this presentation. We just, I just want to show you that there is a ton of data out there. So you, again, we are realizing the widespread impact. Look at this for our students. I put this one up first because most of us here are in, the, in working with youth and educators. Um, yeah, these aren't good. These are not good stats. This is for three or more adverse childhood experiences. Think of our kids right now and the pandemic could have had an impact. That's one. Divorce, we have a 52% divorce rate in this country right now. That's probably increasing. Oh, that could be two right there. The rate of mental illness and substance abuse happening in homes right now. Like, right? It's not, when you think about it, it's, it's not that hard to get to three or more adverse childhood experiences. And I, I'm not trying to paint a hopeless picture because it is not hopeless, but need to understand that these kiddos walking in, you do not know what's going on. So behaviors, all these things that are getting you frustrated and you're just like, darn kids, right? There is so much there that we have to realize the widespread impact. All right, here we go. Quicker on these, but this is coming from a study of Washington school classroom in the state of Washington in, in a district. And this is what they found in their, their average, just in their high school sophomores and seniors. Out of that classroom of 30, only six didn't have any. Awesome. That's great. But look how many did, right? And you know, when you're thinking about, if you're an educator, right? <laughs> when I did it, I can still think back to my last class I had was third period and there were two gentlemen, right? I... 100% now what I know what I know now, and I wish I'd have known then. Guarantee you, those two were impacted. And that's why I was getting those extreme behaviors. And I was getting frustrated. They were getting, like, there was more. And if I'd have known this, gosh, dang it, I would have done so much better. Right? Um, that's the point of this. That's why we're learning this stuff. Right? Just understand it. You aren't quizzing the kids. You do not know this. This is happening. That's quite a bit of your class. I could potentially have it. Okay. 
Suspension. The kid's getting expanded. Why are they getting suspended and expulsion? Well, okay, right? They hate all these things. Look at the increase. Five plus aces. Look at how this goes from zero to five. Plus. Look at that. That's more than double. Okay. Next. Sorry, I'm going through them quick, guys, because we could spend too much time. I just want you to see this gradual increase of everything as aces increase, right? Felonies, being arrested, law and in, in, uh, justice engaged. The more adverse childhood experiences, more likely they will be justice engaged. That's not good for anybody. Life history of depression. This is broken down to men and women, but both of them go up as the ACE score goes up. Early, this is remember the risk taking behavior we talked about. Drug use that is like whoosh, look at that sucker way up there, right? Coping, right? When when you don't have the right neurodevelopment to be able to regulate and cope with the the stress that happens, you find a way to do that. Having a substance use disorder, big increase. Alcoholism. And even married into it. Look at the increase as it goes from ace to ace to ace to ace. The more aces, the more probability. Oops, sorry, I missed one for you. Boom. Okay. Teen pregnancy. That's a life changer. I always told all my eighth graders, man, I want you guys to make mistakes. Please don't make life-changing mistakes. Right? This is a life-changing mistake. Life-changing choice. Right? ACE scores and the prevalence of attempted suicide. That's a scary one. This is high on everyone's list of things we're worried about with our youth, right? Look at that increase with the ACEs. Okay. This is what the data shows overall as you look at this. Early trauma and stress. Predictable. There's predictable patterns. The data is telling us this. There are predictable patterns because of these adverse childhood experiences, whatever realm, household environment, right? Community, look at what we know. That first column of, of green there, that's stuff that we see in schools. That's some of the things we see. There's patterns, we know this is happening. Okay, remember grace for ourselves and grace for others, grace for these students. I know that can be frustrating, I know it, I know. It's hard. Being an educator is the hardest. It is the hardest job, right? Working with youth, being in a facility school, whatever you're doing, whatever you're a part of, when we've taken this work on because we have big hearts, because we love, because we want to uh, do this work, it's hard. And, and so just grace, right? High risk of this early use and abuse of these things. That's not going to help a lot. We're going to see a lot of school dropout, a lot of failures in school, right? That just compounds different things, right? When you are disconnected now to, to a positive community, right? As human beings, we want to belong. We want to be, we're social creatures. We want to be involved with, with people and connected and belonging. And if we're not in a positive way, then we will find it in another way because that's who we are. And then as we get to be an adult, these are predictable we know this is happening from the data, not just making this stuff up, right? Here's my thing. If, if, we, know the, if we know what's going to happen, then we got to stop preventing it. We got to get out front or else I don't, it's just irresponsibility, right? So more people need to understand this data. They need to understand what this is doing and how this is impacting our youth and how it impacts our communities. All right, Donna, we're going to recognize now. We've got to recognize. Yes. So like Zach said, we never know what's coming to us with our students or even what we're bringing to the table for ourselves. So it's so important to recognize the signs. We can see things in our kids all the time that we don't need brain science necessarily to know. It's just being alert, right? You might see a student who is disengaging from the classroom they may start acting out. They could start fidgeting. They might try to get your attention or get the attention of others. Um, and they can also have difficulty maintaining those social skills, those social relationships, 
or saying nobody likes me have lo- demonstrate low self confidence they trauma impacts everything and whenever i'm working with a family a student a teacher a team i'm talking about hmm all right you're seeing these well there's a reason why like zach said earlier there's always a reason and with the impact you, it kids can be getting sick more frequently too it impacts our immune systems and then heart rate, blood pressure, all of that can lead to permanent health problems. So how do we recognize those triggers? Well, when we don't understand a behavior, we tend to assume that a child is doing it on purpose. But in actual actuality, they're really not. We need to dig in and look at that behavior and the root cause of it. And sometimes it takes a lot of conversations and time. So we may see students who are struggling with routine. If you have a change or a lot of transitions, they fall apart. Um, We have to pay attention to that auditory visual stimulation. If they're having a lot of people touching them, they might act out. Um, They could be complaining about situations that it's not fair. Why is this happening to me? Why do you always pick on me? I can't do anything right. Or they'll just have a sudden change and really it comes out of nowhere and you're like, what the heck? Well, that can be a sign of trauma or common, those are all common triggers of trauma too. So when when we're in that triggered response mode, we have the tendency to fight, flight, freeze, or submit. So the fight, You could see them act out aggressively verbally, physically. They test your limits. They can't sit still. They're just flying, going around the room everywhere. That flight tend to isolate themselves, turn inward, get very quiet, maybe remove themselves from the situation and or try to get away. They just want out, right? That freeze, again, they might be daydreaming looking around, not really engaged at all, or shutting down completely emotionally, and you can't even have a conversation. And then that submit, we, we always, I've always talked about fight, flight, or freeze, but one thing we all forget to look at is that submit. They just, yes, whatever you need, afraid to make a mistake, so they just do whatever. Whatever anyone tells them, they'll do it. And oftentimes we see students in this way tend to be bullied and tend to be those ones that get picked on because they're, they just go with the flow of what anyone says. They're afraid to, to stand up because they're afraid of what might happen if they do. So here's another interesting study. You can see based on the ACEs of high school sophomores and seniors, how many actually have no ACEs in this classroom, right? But look at how many have one or more. So if you're sitting in a classroom, you're looking at your 30 students in a classroom, you can see that at least three of those kids have six or more ACEs, and there's only six with no ACE scores. So be aware of your population, get to know your students, And that can help you as a teacher understand behaviors and also understand how to support the students when they're struggling. So let's take a moment and share out. um, How does this change how you see students and families, yourself or your community? Go ahead and unmute or chat. You can answer one or both questions and has this shifted your mindset in what ways? Feel free to unmute or chat. For sure. And if those of you who are at the three level of knowledge on this, we'd love to hear from you. Everybody went quiet. Oh, just processing. Okay, just processing. Go ahead. I just appreciated. Oh, a lot of this, a lot of this, but also the diagram that showed 
the tree with the roots and all the different dimensions um, and of adverse experiences that all the things that feed into, yeah, um, that added to that first study, especially all the, all the roots um, and environment uh, that was really important for me to see some of it. I felt like I knew, but just to see it laid out that way is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And Jennifer, interesting to look at the research and stats that support what you see in classrooms and communities. It's very validating, right? You guys are stressed. You're seeing so much. And now you kind of know why maybe you're seeing this I, I and always, be able to open up conversations. Yeah, I, I always hope that what it does is at the end of this, again, back to being grace, having grace for yourself. Because I think as educators, and I, I'll be the first one to admit it. When I planned all weekend for this really cool lab and I had to get blown up in the first five minutes by a student or two, I took it really personally, right? And that's hard. Like, you know what I mean? And then you wrestle with that. But like now when I knew, know this stuff, I kind of, lo I look at students with the, with behaviors and things and I'm, I just kind of like go like, you know, that's probably not nothing to do with me. Right. And, and that I, now I can respond. We'll get into this, but I don't have to react. So like, ugh, right. Like, and I think that's part of human nature, but hopefully your shift, this is starting to shift the mindset of grace for kids, grace for yourself. Try. I mean, I know I say, and I don't, I don't need mean to be like disrespectful, but just like try to not take it so personally. Right. There is, like Donna said, there's always something behind it. There's always something behind behavior. I love the behavior is communication. I love that phrase. Mm -hmm. They're trying to communicate something and they just, they don't know yet. For crying out loud, they're eight years old with zero tools in their toolbox. For that matter, they're a 17 year old boy with zero tools in their toolbox. Right. And they're trying. And if they had this background and they're trying to express a need, they, it's, yeah. 17 year old boy is probably going to be come across as the disrespectful little pain in the butt. But let's think about that. Let's not, you know, I, that's all, you know, this, hopefully that helps. <laughs> well, and there's some great comments in the, in the chat box too, about just what you're saying, the behaviors, being able to look at specific students and why they might be acting out and also how your classroom is made up. And I love what Helga said too, is that it's measured by impact and not by the event that that's very helpful to think of it that way. I'm glad that's, I, I just think that's huge. Cause I'll have people like, we'll talk about it, you know, and they'll want to, you know, push back, you know, like that happened to me. I was fine. You're like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. I'm glad you were fine. <laughs> but there's so many different factors that not everybody was in your exact situation, you know? And so it wasn't fine for some people. Right. So anyway. All right. So let's get into the respond with that's that, that, that next R we want to, we want to respond and not react. So realizing that there's the widespread, that trauma is widespread. We recognize now we can recognize the signs and symptoms. And before, right. We need to figure out what is the function. Now, Donna and I talk about this all the time when we're, when we're talking about this work is like, Oh man, we, we dig in. I'll tell you, we dig into like, reading, not being, not reading at grade level, not doing math at grade level, all these things, but we, and we find out the function like in the lagging skill, but man, when it comes to behavior and stuff, sometimes I, I feel like we just don't dig enough and we need to find out what is the function of these behaviors. And that is an understanding of some neurodevelopment, right? Why is this happening? Why is that behavior happening? Why is that kiddo like, just go to that place every single time? All right. So basic brain structure, like this is basic guys, but we, we're, none of us are going to be like neuropsychs. I don't think maybe if there are some out there, then you can correct me um, because I'm sure I don't have this exact, but from, from what we really need to know, there's these three main big parts of the brain, right? And um, we've got this rational thinking part of our brain, which we call the neocortex. We got the limbic part of the brain, that emotional feeling part of the brain. And then the brain stem, which is more of our survival brain. 
sometimes you'll see this diagram and this brainstem will actually be called survival brain. But, um, but that, that's the part, that's the part of the brain. Um, sometimes you might see this hand model, right? Where you've got the brain stem. If you're explaining this to kids, all right, you got your thumb in here's the limbic system. And then here's your neocortex or your thinking brain. So this is always helpful to, to explain this to kiddos. Me flip your lid, right? We're not thinking anymore. It's offline. And the only thing is the emotional part. Right. Okay. So th those are just the, uh, some basic structures in the brain that we need to understand as we talk about development. I think the other important, really important piece of this is to understand that that brain structure, all that stuff with the brain, um, it's, it's not just, it's not, it's not just born this way, right? We aren't just born with this fully functioning brain. I think most people understand that, but that it's built, right? And it's like, it is actually built um, and through different sensitive times in childhood development, right? They, they say that um, over 90% of the brain from zero to three is actually formed. Um, and so that's a lot. That's a lot of work going on in those early years. So think about that, those early years and adverse childhood experience when a lot a lot of synapses are happening. A lot of architecture is being, um, is being built. Okay. So when we look at, we look at those areas of the brain, um, and we then look at the typical development versus developmental trauma. So these adverse childhood experiences, I really like this graphic and I like how this tri triangle helps to explain this. Go on the left there and let's look at typical development. And what I'm, what I'm, what I'm looking at here in this triangle is like the, the, as they grow older from bottom to top, as you get older, what we, what we would like ideally like to see is that the survival part of the brain is being developed um, quickly, right? So not an over amount of, of time and energy spent developing that because you're born as a, as an infant into a healthy environment, a healthy family where your basic needs, right? Your food, your sleep, your shelter, your all those are taken care of. So those synapses are like, we're good. Like I, I'm good. I, I'm surviving, right? Like all these things can connect. When I cry, they feed me. Like I'm, when I'm cold, they put a blank, I'm good to go, right? So I don't have to spend a whole lot of time, right? And I can move up into the next part of the brain, getting into our limbic system and the emotional part of regulation, right? How do I regulate my own things as, as we go? And we, we know this in neuro, any of you that had children, right? We're, we're getting into that phase as the kids started getting older, where we want them to start to regulate for themselves a little bit. We let them cry a little bit longer. We let them fuss a little bit longer. We want them to start learning how to self-regulate, right? And be able to meet some of those needs, right? And that's, that's another very big developmental stage in life where they learn that. Okay, so the, typically we want that to happen. We do it with, you know, with trusted and, and good caring adults around and they learn how to do that in a healthy way. When we get up to the next, so that's social emotion. Now we start like learning from, you know, and, and, and saying words to our, you know, mom or dad or caregiver or whatever. And they're responding back to us. And we're starting to learn social emotional cues. And we're, we're starting to learn, you know, to manage our own emotions and, you know, how we do that in a healthy way. And then there's, you know, hopefully a response to some of those, like it's starting to go well. And then by age four or five, right, we're into this part of the brain at this point where we can start um, with cognition. And that makes sense. That's when we usually start preschool and those kind of things, right? The brain is ready for that kind of stuff in typical development. We've done all the, all the other stuff is taken care of. So yes, now we've got these kids that are, that their survival part of the brain is good, right? Healthy, regulate, they can regulate, they can self-soothe, they can do these things, they understand it, they have good social emotional um, skills, and they, they can use cues, they can do these things. And then now, great, now I can start using their cognitive part, I can start learning skills, letters, numbers, colors, all this good stuff, typical development. Okay. When I get to developmental trauma, here's why it impacts brain development. Here's why we get the impact, negative impact. When needs aren't met, there's neglect, right? Those basic needs of hunger, safety, shelter, all these things, right? 
There's no touch. There's none of these things. Their brain, right, are, as a human species, right, as most animal and plant species, right, we're, we're engineered to survive. And so they are going to survive. And they're going to develop neural pathways to do that. So even though things are not going on healthy, like the body's like, wait, wait, you are, we're in survival mode right now. There's cortisol and adrenaline pumping through my system. Like this isn't healthy. I have to then, I have to change the way my, my survival mechanism is, is, is doing so, you know, in in responding to this so I can survive because there's no way I can live with this elevated kind of heart rate, these elevated levels of hormone. Like I can't, it's not healthy. So I'm not going to do it. So we spend that little one spends an, a very large amount of time just working on survival systems in the brain. And baby, they are hardwired, right? Hardwired brains. This isn't choice in here. This is not cognition. This is not executive functioning. This is survival. And then once we get that figured out, now we're at regulation, right? Now we're spending a ton of time figuring out how we're going to regulate all this stuff. Where then we're spending a lot of time how we are going to be emotionally, right? How we respond that and manage our own emotions, all these kind of things. And you can see how much room is left for cognition at age four and five. And so we think, can you just imagine? So we think we're getting this preschooler, this four or five-year-old, maybe into kindergarten that's ready to learn. Uh, No, 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 they're not. They're absolutely not ready to learn. They're still surviving. They're just getting started to get in their brain in a place where they can start to learn. Profound impacts. If you think about this, right? Profound when we think of it as educators and what we assume is happening. We assume what's happening is on the left and our educational system is created for what's happening on the left. Definitely not what's happening on the right. Okay. Now we there, and we'll talk about a little bit. Yes, can we change it? Yes, can we do these things? Yes, are there things that we can do to help? Absolutely, it's not a hopeless conversation we're having here. But when we build things on a weak foundation, because of the adverse childhood, we get PISA, right? It's it's a it's not a good foundation. If we can get out in front and we can build these foundations, obviously we build stronger brain architecture. Obviously, we can get, you know, get better growth, better achievement, all those kind of things as we go through, okay? One of the ways we can do this um, is the servant, this idea of serve and return. And this is that relationship between an adult and a young person. Again, the earlier we do this, the better, right? If we built that strong firm foundation, we talked about the behavior as communication. So if, we, if, if there is a response when I am, think of me as a little guy and I'm screaming because I'm hungry and no one responds to that, that's going to be problematic, right? But if we do, if we return, if adults, positive people in their life are, are creating this feedback, then that is so important for brain development. They call that serve and, serve and return. And it's very important for brain development. All right, Don, I think you're up. All right. So how do we resist that re-traumatization, right? The last thing we want to do is interact with a student and come put them in a situation or ourselves in a situation where we're re-traumatized. So number one, understand the different types of stress. Two, understand a person's response to stress. Three, under stress, understand what stress tolerance is. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So there's three kinds of stress. First, positive stress, right? Not all stress is bad. And some stress helps prepare our young brains and bodies for our future, for future challenges, such as things like meeting new people. The first day of school can be exciting for a lot of students doing performances, a competition, maybe even a speech in a class or working together as a team to build a project and then getting to present that or letting, they don't feel like presenting it, letting them put it on display and others walking by. Those are positive stress that then can build that foundation so that when we get into the other types of stress, we have those coping strategies. 
So next level is tolerable stress. So the example here, a death in the family. For most people, that's part of life. It's common to have that. And we go through our grieving process. Life continues forward. And if we have supportive adults for the child to calm the stress response and we teach coping skills, not necessarily when they're escalated, we use pre-teaching of coping skills with our students so that when they are elevated or stressed, they have that skill to do. And they're not trying to learn it while they're elevated or escalated. Um, moderate te- the moderate stress It won't be as toxic to the developing brain, although it does still have an impact on the brain. And then the third kind, that toxic stress, that trauma, that abuse, neglect, that it can be parental, it can be student addiction, where no one is there to help them through those circumstances. I had a student when I was teaching whose mom and dad were never home at night. And they would go and get groceries, put them in the fridge, and that was it. Found out they were eating raw hamburger at night just to have something to eat. That's a type of trauma for them and signs of abuse and neglect. And by getting to know that family, getting to know my my students, we were able to get them the resources and help they needed so that there was not that neglect. And really, it wasn't the parents doing wrong. They were trying to live and make money to have a roof over their heads. But by getting to take the time and getting to know my students, I was able to provide them with resources and the family with resources. So that toxic stress is the ongoing. It it is continuous and that really crumbles that foundation. So when we're experiencing stress, it starts in our cortex, right? If we're, if we're able to maintain it, we remain calm and alert. Then as it overloads, it moves into the limbic where we get that alarming kind of maybe just for me get jittery on the inside. And then you become fearful when it moves into the midbrain. What's going to happen if I don't do this? If, or the what ifs start coming in and our brain starts talking ourselves out of whatever we're doing and saying we can't do it. And then if it continues, that stress just continues, become terror, it's terror. And that's where you see that flight, flight, freeze, submit come into play immediately. And students in this state, don't talk to them, let them calm, help them with their coping skills that you've already pre-taught, hopefully. And then once they're ready, you can re-engage and talk about what happened and, uh, and help them through lowering that stress. The other component is that executive functioning piece. A lot of students, when, we, when they have trauma or experiencing high stress, our executive functioning skills go all out the window. And for students who have many adverse childhood experiences, you often see that they have trouble staying focused, they don't have organizational skills, and they are, it's more difficult for them to accept change. So think of it like the air traffic controller, right, in the tower. All these planes flying through our brains every day, and our brain is trying to keep track of what's happening, what we need to do, just like the air, con- traffic con- air traffic controller, there's a plane landing, there's another one coming in. How am I going to keep them from crashing? So it's so important to teach executive functioning skills to students. Chunk work, do check-ins with them. Teach them how to manage the stress using great executive functioning strategies, which later in the year, we will have a forum just for executive functioning strategies. And also, if you guys ever want to learn more, we can deliver professional development individually or to school teams. And because you attended the forum today, you get 10% off those trainings automatically. So executive functioning is a critical part of our lives. Um, As a special educator and advocate for students with special and gifted needs, this is always something I look at first, because a lot of times a student 
doesn't unnecessarily understand what they're supposed to do or can't even start a project or an assignment. But if you break it down into chunks and then let them do a little bit, check in with them, give them immediate, timely, and actionable feedback, they can correct that, then move on to the next stage. It's the most frustrating thing in the world when you get done with a project and then somebody says, oh, you didn't do it right. Go and do it all over, right? But if you do those things along the way for students, not only is it helping them alleviate the stress and your stress, it also develops those executive functioning skills that are so critical to all components of our life. And is related to brain development, just a side note there, that, mm-hmm. um, there's two kind of sensitive areas of the brain where you're really learning this and where the brain is primed to do that. And that's ages two to six. And then again, in adolescence, so those are two, remember we talked about sensitive areas. Those are some times where we can start to reintroduce those skills, emphasize those skills, teach those skills two to six. And then again, in, 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 um, in adolescence. So you could see how people might struggle with that. If those adverse childhood experiences are happening during those developmental times, right? Yep. And tying that back to what we said earlier about when a a student is struggling, they don't have that executive function to even work through. So we have to help them with that. So what happens when air traffic control isn't working? Anybody have thoughts on that that you want to share in the chat? What might some be some behaviors that you might see? So um, students could act out. Um, they could get angry. They could act out um, against adults, against other students, um, for example. Yeah, they might refuse to do their work. They're not turning in their work. Some of them complete their work and don't turn it in because they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble that it's wrong. Um, And we see those stress responses, the overwhelm, the overwhelming like responses, the dysregulation, but it can also be more than that. It can also be them turning inward. Don't forget that. You have that child that's sitting in the back of the classroom, afraid to raise their hand. They could be anxious and afraid for the feedback. Deborah, yes, outburst, depression. We currently so, have. Oh, go we ahead. Curr- we currently have um, a classroom of second graders where there are about like four or five criers. Like they just start crying, and the teacher is struggling to get them to express the emotions yeah, it, that they're feeling. Yep, and you know what I always recommend in those situations: take a look at your classroom and the structure of your classroom. Do the students have a routine? Is it posted? And do you refer back to them, to that routine that's posted? Okay, we're on this. We have five minutes left. Next, we'll be doing this. Preparing them for those transitions and then also doing those check-ins before they get to the crying stage. And sometimes you can't predict what's gonna, what's, when they're going to cry or not or what's going to set them off. So for those students that you're working with, it's even more critical to dig deeper and and get to know them and maybe do some layered supports of small groups and individual supports. Yeah. Definitely and, talking about definitely talking about understanding how they're feeling in their emotions like when they start because before they cry they're feeling something. That's like that's now they're into the survival brain, right? Now that's mm-hmm. these emotional outbursts because they're coping with this overwhelm that now their cognitive part is overwhelmed, right? They've gone down the layers do 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 and now that's that's what you're seeing and so just helping them that and like a universal thing in the classroom is having those, those outlets, those, un- those, those regulation tools, or maybe a calm down space that everybody can use. They'll, we'll go into some of those, but that's the kind of stuff when you get, when you're trying to get out in front of this stuff, how, how do we help them before they get to that plot of space? Yeah. I like, really like how you guys are putting everything kind of in set. Um, I'm at a new school and kind of had noticed a lot more different behaviors that have been happening. Um, um, we have one kiddo that does struggle with a lot of it. And then we have one kiddo who you were talking about where they struggle with just doing the work and they don't really want to do the work because they can't do the work and they think it's too hard. So how you guys are putting this into um, work, it like really makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah, it helps because I am a mentor and I teach second step. And today, one of my new students that I had, it took a while for us to meet because the father was hesitant, came to me after meeting him last Friday. He called down and said, I want to go speak to Miss James. And when he got there, he was overwhelmed because he said it was the math work. So when I went and further investigated with the teacher and the guidance counselor, it's like that in every class, but he's dealing with a deaf and his father doesn't want him to like seek the help. Mm -hmm. So he's dealing with like all this emotion. So this stuff right here is something that can be used to help him. Absolutely. Yep. I had one of those Absolutely. students too. That was the hardest thing in the world. I had one of those, it was an eighth grader and the behaviors that he was engaging in were really got him in big trouble, but it all stemmed from exactly your exact situation where he never was allowed to talk about it or deal with or have any help around the grief of losing his mom. And, oh man, it was, it was tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And I just got a new client last week who's, dad died by suicide and the student it's two years later and now he's having the acting out behaviors and I'm working with the school and family because not only did that impact his executive functioning his stress tolerance but now we're seeing an impact on his academics so we're doing more data analysis gathering more cognitive academic and social emotional data to better inform our decisions on how to provide interventions and supports to him because there are learning gaps as a result now too. So when we look, talk about these things, when we're experiencing things, we have the window of stress tolerance, right? I like to think of it like I open my window, I'm nice and calm, right? I'm, I'm sitting there, breeze is flowing in, but as I get more stressed, I want to close that window. And what happens then, I'm less able to talk to people. I'm less able to engage in additional activities. And I need more time to process and time to calm myself down before any additional demands are made. So in our window of, of stress tolerance, when we reach our breaking point, that's when we see the lid of our brain flip. It just goes bam. And it's, there's nothing that any of us can do about it. And how we react is different for every person. I think, again, to back to having grace for yourself and not take it personally, this is because that part of the brain, the survival brain, remember the triangle, so much energy and effort and so much brain development happened in survival that this is what happens when they reach that, that level of tolerance and they just can't take any more it goes to the survival part of the brain, which is very developed. It's not a thinking, they're not making a decision like, oh man, I'm going to ruin her day right now, man. No, mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a complete spoon and it is about surviving. It's as, as if a bear was attacking, right? And you're not thinking about, oh, look at that bear. That's cute. No, you're like, Rah! and you react. And it's it's this, it's the same thing. Once, once it's flipped, once you're out of that window, right? Like Donna said, like, it's it's not a conscious decision at that point right well, it's, it's not like a choice the, yeah it's like the watermelon right the challenge where they put the rubber bands on the watermelon <laughs> to see how many rubber bands will break and yes. burst there's no one going back once that bursts no nope. so one other yeah and and you know did that kid not get breakfast was there were they late to school were they worried about like traffic did they not get up in time all those things are just a rubber band around that watermelon and eventually the last one's put on you never know when that last one's gonna be and poo I, I love that so think of this everybody think of the watermelon right some of your kids are coming to you with a hundred rubber bands already on them mm -hmm. they're already got them they're there they are ready to explode so when you say hey zach take out your pencil and you don't zach i, I told you your pencil get it out Zach, why are you not taking out your pencil <laughs> And there it's you gone. go. Then it's over. And then Zach, you go see to the office. other side to Zach, right? Yeah. And that's that's what that window, like a lot of people are coming to is a watermelon with no rubber bands. And some kids, and we don't know, those are invisible. They're under their clothes, right? We have no idea how many rubber bands they got around them. But some of them, when they're coming with a hundred rubber bands and you, you're like, oh my God, 
I just asked Zach for a pencil. Are you kidding me right now? Yeah, but we don't know what else happened. So think of it, guys. Behavior is communication. I really believe that a kiddo is not in that moment going, oh, she asked me for a pencil. Oh, she did not. You wait, right? That's not, that's not what's going on. <laughs> I love that, Donna. That's awesome. I'm going to make this slide present. I'm going to get that video of that from now on. I love that. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Let's do what a little share. Yeah. So what have you learned about stress? How does this help you with your own life? And how might this help you understand the development of your students? Go ahead and feel free to unmute or put it in the chat box. Something that I've learned through the years with stress is when you bring stress into a classroom, it can really change the atmosphere and how the kids learn. <laughs> um, and I really try to kind of remind my coworkers and peers that whatever we have going on inside, it's best to try to do our best leaving, leaving it outside of the school. But I think what really help is, helps is to have the ability to be able to talk to someone when you're kind of feeling at that level or just asking someone, hey, I need to just take a break for a moment. And then also kind of noticing it, how it may affect the child as well. How is it affecting the student? Um, and just being able to take that time and that step back to be more in their shoes and understand and just letting them talk things out to you. Um if they feel, you know, how making them feel comfortable to be able to communicate that with you. Yep. And sometimes they come to you when it's like, you can't do it. So somebody's just saying, you know what, I'm really busy right now, but I will get to you as soon as I can. Or how about we meet at this time? Even just that recognition that you see they're stressed or something's happening can help them calm and know that they're going to have a time to chat with you. And it also helps them process what they're going to say too. My favorite thing to do when my kids would come up to me when I was, when they were little is mom, mom, I need this. Well, I'd be making dinner and have a million things going on. And I tell them my hands are busy right now. As soon as they're free, I'll come and get you. Right? Like little recognition can go a long way. I see some uh, stuff in the chat that's, yeah, there's that a we really, want to talk about. There's a really good a question from Elizabeth Daly. Is this the Elizabeth Daly that I know? <gasps> I'm just curious because I know an Elizabeth Daly. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's I don't North know it's not. You know me from Did you were Douglas? you Douglas County? Were you with no. Douglas School District? Okay. okay. <laughs> nope, different one. <laughs> I was like, that's a pretty like exact same name. All right, cool. That's a great question, though. Um, Donna, you might be able to answer that better than better than me. But it it is very, I think, the, for my point of a prevention guy, it's very difficult to tell the difference, right? Because we don't know. And that's why, as we'll get into a little later, um, we'll have some time but to talking about just universal things that we can do for all kinds of dysregulation. I mean, this is all really good information to, to know. And, and for sure, kids without adverse childhood, uh, adverse childhood experiences can get into overwhelm and, and emotional dysregulation, you know, absolutely for sure. Um, and I don't know if it looks different, but what I can tell you is the strategies that you use for someone that's impacted with childhood experiences for dysregulation works for kids with dysregulation. All right. You, you, you tell them more, Don. Yeah. And I think too, that, without a history of, of the ACE scores or the trauma, that they, they tend to be able to recover more quickly. And if you dig in and there's not any trauma and they're still struggling as a special educator, that would tell me maybe there is something deeper like a learning disability that hasn't been yet discovered that's setting it off or some type of brain development you can ask about birth history, right? Their development at, as they were growing, were they talking? Were they overly sensitive to sensory input? It could even be the visual auditory stimulation. Their brain just processes things and hears things and it's not filtering out. Like the fan in the room could be setting them off and you may not know it, but if you dig a little deeper, you can get to the to the cause of that. It may not be trauma. It could be something else.
And Ke Kendra loved your point. Absolutely. That's a great, great takeaway. Mm -hmm. And that's that cum cumulative effect, right? That's, and that's what's going on really. And um, we know as in adults, right? So not adverse childhood experience, but chronic and toxic stress affects us as adults. It affects our physical health, our mental health, huge, because our body is not supposed to have that much adrenaline and cortisol surging through it at all times. That's the stress response. Our, our body normally functioning will get a surge. And then we have the systems in place to come down, calm everything down, you know, let that, those, those hormones dissipate and, and then come back to um, a baseline. Right. But if we are always in an elevated state, always, 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 um, it really impacts our, our physical health. Our immune systems go, it's not good for immune system, cardiovascular. I mean, my, I'll tell you my sister, one of the most brilliant women I've ever known in my entire life, um, because of the chronic stress as an adult almost died because of that. She got so, so ill, um, because of this constant stress and her immune system absolutely shut down. She went into adrenal failure. I mean, it was just bad. Right. That's what can happen. It's, it's sad for sure. What were you going to say, Donna? Um, so something I learned this week recently was how you were talking about hormones, how if your hormones are not regulated, that it will actually lock your hormones from, from producing and your stress then because your, your cortisol and all of that ends up coming out of whack. So then you're less able to tolerate and you're less able to learn. Yep. Right. So I, even just for me personally found out my hormones are all out of whack. So they put me on the hormone on progesterone to be able to bring my brain back, be able to sleep well at night and be able to respond to stress. So we got to remember that physiological piece too Huge. we can't and, and use your healthcare professionals and that's why we ask when we do an evaluation for a student in special education about the health history yep. because it's all tied together all right let's talk about this right there's the the resilience piece right i think this is important for kids for us um for anybody and especially those who have been impacted by youth how do we build resilience right how do we cope how do we are able to respond and then adapt to these situations so here's a little quiz for you is resilience something a person is born with yes or no is resilience influenced by experiences is resilience something that can be learned and is resilience something that can be changed it's a trick question quiz they're all yeses yes <laughs> Resilience is complex, but yeah, yep, that, they're all yeses. They, there's a lot that goes into it, for sure. All right. Um, I love what Alberta Family Wellness did. If you ever want to just like dig into this stuff and geek out like I like to do, go to the, uh, the albertafamilywellness.org and look at what, they, what they've done. You'll notice a lot of these things come from that because I think they're, they did some brilliant work um, and really had a, a, a great way of talking about resilience and, and, and how brains can bounce back. How, again, this is not a hopeless conversation. There is hope, right? Um, yes, it takes work, but we're not going to leave you with this. Like, okay, kids experience adverse childhood experiences and well, that's it, man. Shrug your shoulders. No, absolutely not. Um, because brains are resilient and let's, let's figure out, let's talk about why that is. If we look at it as a scale, right. With negative experiences, positive supports, on the nice little bar there, right? And then you got the fulcrum in the middle. Um, that fulcrum in the middle, that's that's really your starting point. There, You see like it looks like the helix there of the double helix for genetics. That's where your starting point is, that either more resilient or less resilient. And that's going to give more or less leverage to positive or negative um, experiences, as you can see, as you can tell. So let's say... Given everything's equal, but I am I am on the my my genetics, my adverse childhood experiences, my just all those things that we talked about that that could influence whether you've been impacted by these events, right? Um, let's say they move you more on the less resilient side, and you can now see where it gives now more leverage, 
even though we might have the same amount of negative positive ba- balanced out because everybody has hard times and there's good time there's right that's life um but when we start off that way you it unfortunately gives more leverage to the negative and if we're more resilient right if it's the other side to the more resilient um or i mean if it's staying that way the only way then we can get back to the positive we got to add more positive supports or we got to add more on that end of the scale to start tipping it in the positive where we get those positive outcomes instead of the negative outcomes. Okay. And we can do that. We definitely, um, we ourselves as adults can do that for ourselves, but we're there. We have the capacity to do that as, as educators, as caregivers, as parents, as whatever, you know, interacting with these youth, how can we do that for our kiddos? Okay. And those positive outcomes, all the good stuff. That's what we're, that's what we want. That's what we want to do. So we want to, we want to get there. All right. Like I said, that fulcrum is our starting point and it gives more leverage. So you can see if we're way far more resilient, right. And our genetics, everything we've got, you know, maybe one, maybe a few adverse childhood experiences, but we had positive uh, support factors in place and, and we're just there. We're on the more resilient side, right? Lucky, lucky few, the lucky, those that, that are there. That's great. Um, they have, a, they have that capacity for positive outcomes. And then there we have the ones that aren't. And we just discussed all those things that could move us over to that other side. Because that really does matter. The starting point does matter. Just like the brain architecture matters, just like starting early matters. This, it does matter because it gives more leverage to those, to those negative experiences, unfortunately. Some, again, back to the conversation about impact, your, you know, the event, it's not the in, event, it's the impact because Again, if you're fulcrum, right, if we're moved over there and that's where we're at, then those those things that might not affect somebody will affect someone that is less resilient. Okay. And again, we have this could you could relate this to that window of stress tolerance, right? If we're more resilient, we have more tolerance. We have we're able we're we have the ability to take on more negative things that come. We're able to bounce back. We're able to be more resilient. Right. And the few of those positive things can keep us where we want to be. So how do we do that? How do we build resilience? Um, that's people in, if it, we're talking about a child and young, which it's much easier, right? It's much easier in the early developmental stages and in childhood and adolescence where the brain is still, it's still pruning. It's still developing synapses. It's still in those, it's those sensitive areas um, of development. If we as adults, caregivers, if we can start to come alongside and we can start to put in some positive supports, we can totally move that fulcrum. We can totally move it in a place um, that then is going to give less leverage to those negative experiences. And once we get there, right, then we're doing, we're, we get positive outcomes for kids. And if we're talking about our kids, we're talking about our youth that we know that have had many, many adverse childhood experiences where maybe there's epigenetics, right? There's generational trauma. They're in those communities. They experience some national, uh, natural disasters, all those realms, those three different realms. Then what we got to do is we got to pile on more supports because that's where they're at. That's their starting point. And it's unfortunate, but that's where their starting point is. So we can keep putting on more positive supports, more, you know, more caring adults, more connection, more belonging more academic supports, more behavioral supports, all these kind of things, right? The really good news about this is caring adults can build that resilience. Hey, Donna. And with that, here's some examples of things that happen when one caring adult gets involved, right? You can actually get ahead of the game just by having the student know one adult that they can go to, that they can turn to, that they can share with, that they can rely upon. That doesn't mean that it has to be you. It can be anyone, but it can also be more than one caring adult. And it, But as long as they have at least one, they can build up their resilience. That can have a profound effect for sure. Yep. And so the progressive nature of, of adversity, here's another chart to just explain things to you. Um, again, early trauma and stress 
it's very predictable on what's going to happen with brain development. We can see the learning problems. Your cognitive development is lo often lower. Um, your working memory can be affected, which again is tied to that cognitive development. We see a lot of kids getting diagnosed with ADHD and ADD now um, when, yes, it's real, they have it, but it's caused by that early childhood trauma, um, that aggressive behavior, that withdrawn, the poor understanding of social cues can all lead to that. And then the high risk of early use and abuse of alcohol, tobacco, drugs, prescription drugs, um, what happens there? We often see them get, have to go into special education, drop out of school, really struggle with completing school. A lot of them get disciplined. And in Zach and my world, we, we talk about restorative discipline rather than what's here, the suspension, expulsion, truancy, prison, school to prison pipeline is huge right now. And then that adult adversity. We see a lot of intergenerational risk. Zach and I went to Pueblo a couple weeks ago and talked to them. And this is something that came up. How do we break the general, the generations of trauma or neglect, drug abuse? How do we stop that? Because then it leads into all these problems in adulthood. So if we can once again go back to early intervention, and you may not, if you're, you don't get to get the kids, it's what you get when you get them, Right. But if we can understand that and then provide them supports for the older high school students, a great way to break that generational trauma or the lack of resiliency is to work with them on vocational skills, get them into career pathways, find out what they're interested in. You can use those interests then to engage them and motivate them, right? Tie their learning, give them a project that they really like airplanes. Well, math has a lot of, of stuff or airplanes have a lot of stuff to do with math you can write stories and history on those so many ways you can engage them if you know what the child is interested in and give them the pathways and hope for future a lot of this is tied to hope for future and remember that's, go ahead zach well it's just that's why we put these slides in again right like these these two this is important right we did this at the beginning you see this with all this knowledge, right? Like we know what's going to happen. Yep. Where it's predictable, which means it's preventable. So keep it simple, right? Number one protective thing, belonging, right? Just give them a sense of belonging, connect with them, keep their dignity and self-worth intact, help them to feel accepted for who they are. You're not asking them to change. You're accepting them, meeting them where they are and growing alongside them by establishing relationships, making connections, and making everything purposeful and meaningful. It's simple, that's it. right? That, that's I mean, if, if that's all you do, guys, if that's all we do, then, then we're, we're making a difference. It's 100% research-based. We will make a difference. We don't have to get all crazy and overwhelm ourselves. Like if these things happen with our students that have been impacted by trauma, we're, we're going to see some, it's going to help. It's going to move the fulcrum. It really will. All right. Not, not only you can talk about all kind of other good stuff, right? Okay. So what are some universal strategies that are trauma responses, responsive? Also, obviously social emotional learning. Yes. You can get a copy and we also have it posted in the chat and we can repost it. Sorry about that. So social emotional <laughs> learning is the key. Um, we do that at GSN. We have curriculum for it, empowering education, our own GSN curriculum, and professional development. So reach out to us. We can support you with getting that. Circles, circling students up. Love doing this start of the day. Students walk in, they get in the circle, ask them a question. How many of you had breakfast today? Thumbs up, thumbs down, right? Or how many of you are feeling tired? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Scale of one to 10, how stressed are you right now? They can hold up their fingers. That starts getting them engaged. You can stop it and do a circle at any time. They're disengaging. Okay, hey guys, let's circle up. Pick a ton fun topic. What are you looking forward to over fall break? And start talking. They're done in five minutes or less. 
sit back down there, re-engaged. Restorative discipline. Like I said, Zach and I are not big believers in suspension, expulsion, truancy. What can we do instead? How can we work together, take ownership, have accountability, and still have that dignity and self-worth intact when we do something wrong? We all make mistakes. How do we help kids learn from them? And then, like I said, having your agendas on the board, referring back to them, providing those transition warnings. What's predictable? If we make things predictable, then it's not out of our control. Remember that, yeah, everyone, that like in a student impacted by a lot of adverse childhood experiences, they're, it, it's chaos, right? Things are not predictable. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what the, the adult is that's coming. It's all everything. So um, that's where, if you remember way back, the, the trigger, a trigger is unpredictability. Anything that you can do to help a kid understand what's coming next or what's going to happen during the day or how things are going to go, you know, is going to help, again, the window of stress tolerance. Put the agenda on the board. Let them know what's coming. And if you're going to change it, give them some warning. Right. And, and, st- and tell them how they're going to complete that assignment. Show them the exemplar. And here's how we're going to get work there. Help them backward plan and then begin. Regulation space, like Zach said, do you have a calming space in your classroom with maybe quiet, you know, you can have noise canceling headphones, you could have music for them to listen to, you can teach them to set a timer so they don't abuse it. And if they need more time, they can just put a signal up and they get a couple, two more minutes to regulate. Teaching them those strategies before so they know how to use them. Use that space, that those tools, some of our schools have the ability to have a separate calm, calming room, a home base where it's manned by an adult. Adults take turns being in that room. Kids can go and access it. There's puzzles, there's games, and lots of calming tools, but also an adult that they can access if they want to talk. And then organized and decluttered classroom. I've said this, visual auditory stimulation right? That can overwhelm any of us. For me, if I walk into my house after work and the kids haven't put the dishes in the sink or in the dishwasher, they've thrown their backpacks everywhere. I haven't been home and I didn't get to make my bed. I immediately feel like, oh, take a look around your classroom. The school that my kids went to in elementary school, they actually chose calm colors and whatever was being not used for instruction, they would pull a curtain over it. And it felt like you were in a home and it was calming and soothing just to walk into every classroom because there wasn't all this coming at you all the time. And I used to even, if my kids could go get overwhelmed or I wanted, I knew it was going to be something hard. I turned down my lights. I brought in lamps from Goodwill or whatever I had left over from home. I turn off those fluorescent lights and use that to light my classroom during that time. Flexible seating. Okay. Flexible seating healthy snacks, crunchies, chewies, whatever, movement breaks, letting them go and carry something that's heavy to the office for you, or getting a quick drink of water. And remember adult self-care. Like you mentioned when we were talking, how your adults come in with things and they're stressed. They, kids feel that. So we got to take care of ourselves. And we also need to be models of healthy adaptive skills Talk to them when you're feeling st- frustrated. Zach and I are going to stick around for Q&A, but we're going to move through these last slides here. Stay connected with us. Um, we do lots of things for schools. We get private and donor grant funding. We partner with you to get the money, and then we get to go out and coach, mentor, and train and give you whatever you need. We have our whole staff committed to this. And some ways to stay connected, we have Empowering Education, Because you attended this training, you'll have the PowerPoint. Click on that link and you immediately get a free two-week trial for our SEL curriculum, along with our monthly SEL newsletter. And there's the link in there too to sign up for that. So upcoming grant opportunities, people always ask us, how do we have grants? Well, here's some that are coming up. Colorado Department of Education, the ninth, ninth grade success grant our computer science teacher grant, which yes, computer science, but you get technology. 
plus social emotional learning training PLCs with that. So, and we can develop a grant for anything a school needs. We make it work. The easy grant, the empowering action for school improvement, if your school falls in that category, we can develop that with you. And one of our favorites, the bully prevention grant, because we can do so much with that grant. And we have a hugely successful success rate for getting these grants when we partner with schools. We have a whole team ready to develop the grants for you. We would appreciate it if you fill out your feedback survey. Zach, can you drop the link in or do you want me to? I think I can. Oh, I can't. Okay. And uh, so if you fill out this survey, take a moment. You can use your phone and scan the QR code there. We'll also put the link in the chat. If you fill that out today, that's how we get you your certificate of attendance for your CEUs. And if you have additional questions, you can email Zach or me at any time. And in the, in the presentation, you'll see our emails at the end as well. Um, we do value your feedback. We look at it after each forum as a whole team, not just Zach and me, and look at what we're going to add next and how we're going to adjust our presentations for you for future. So remember, this was part one. Part two, November 14th, 4 to 5.30 p.m. Hopefully we have some returning customers because we love getting to know you as well. We'll dig in a little bit more with more strategies and, and some more, you know, more of that kind of thing for sure. And like Zach and I said, we're here. We're going to hang out for a bit. Feel free to ask any questions you have. Eastern time? No, it's Mountain Standard time. So it would be 6 to Sorry. 730 in November. And you'll, you'll get this, you'll get this, um, uh, presentation. So there's, I don't know, just some useful resources that you might like. And you'll get the presentation and the recording. Yep. And Zach, next page, there's our email. Let us know. If you're having a hard day, you can reach out. We can give you some tools too. We're here for you whenever. And thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you. We know it's busy. Any, <laughs> any remaining questions that you have for us or musings that you want to share? We're here. I think one question I have right now is, so we currently have a kiddo who kind of disturbs the entire class. Um, we have a behavioral team, but I still kind of feel like it's not necessarily working because it's just the same repeated behavior in every class. Do, and so, oh, go ahead, Zach. Well, no, I just wonder, like, as the behavior team, or is anybody like have these conversations of of the trying to identify that root cause, or is there a lagging skill? Have we gotten that far yet? Like, do we know why they're disrupting the classroom? Um, so it's hard because I have, um, I'm like a one on one, but I see it consistently in every classroom because I move classes with the with like my group of third graders um and it's hard because i don't feel like necessarily like the observations of what's actually happening um the other the behavioral team is not necessarily understanding that and trying to figure out how to communicate with them to maybe just come and observe one day to see what's actually happening but he is also getting breaks. Um, this child is getting breaks too. And so, but it's hard because every time they come back to class, it's the same. It's just happening again. So they'll get are a break. You, uh, are you keeping data for yourself that then you yeah. give to the behavior team? Yeah, I'm keeping data for, for them. And then also um, we give them that data, but... Hi, but they're not really it's it's like it's the same thing every day they're putting a blanket approach on it yeah mm. and have they done a functional behavior assessment to get to the antecedent of the behavior have they gone to that point yet i like they so i know this is a repeated student 
Um, and I know a little bit more of the background of what he's coming from, but it's hard because it's still, it's the same thing. He disrupts the students and then the students um, kind of act on that behavior as well. And it, mm-hmm. it goes on all day. And does he, does your school have a, a special education classroom that he goes to? Yeah, they decided. So we have, but right now too, the hardest part is um, the teachers are currently non-consistent. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's also a frustrating part because I believe this would need more consistency. So they said that they were going to try next week to see if that changes to give them a break after every class and try that. But it's hard because they're not staying in the class to actually see that behavior going on. And that's what's really tough. And so okay. I'm hearing they haven't done the assessment though, right? That's what you're, mm-hmm. or do you know? Yeah. Um, They did, I guess they've done like, a, I don't, Actually, I don't know if they've done like an actual assessment okay. of why of what the root cause is and why it's happening, but it's definitely this child does cause a lot of like he wants a lot of the attention and like they do fine in one class, but then when it comes to the other classes or outside, the behavior gets destructive. Okay, just, so oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just uh, wondering. Well, I mean, are you thinking? Do you have like in your own? Just you're the one with this child the lo- most. Is that correct? Yes. What What is your like gut feeling telling it? Like, what do you What do you think is the is just What do you think is the is the problem? It's tough. It's tough because what I'm seeing every time they take a break and when they come back, it's something against another student. Um, or it's just, it's just continuously becoming, um, disruptive in the classroom. So, so, it, so what I, what I work. see that, yeah, what I see that as is attention seeking yeah. behaviors yeah. and also trying to deflect, right? Yeah. So with just what you've shared, my brain goes to one, what's the trauma? Two, mm-hmm. what's their cognitive ability mm-hmm. and what's their academic ability, right? Mm-hmm. If I, if I know, you know, the student may have a very different cognitive or IQ mm-hmm. with some deficits, mm-hmm. like, for example, I often see kids who have really high vocabulary and visual spatial skills. Mm -hmm. But then their working memory and processing are not the same level. Mm -hmm. Um, And they may have average processing or working memory, but they're really high in another area. And so then because their, their brain's moving so quickly in those other areas, but their average processing and they can't, their working memory isn't able to pull it out quickly enough Mm -hmm. that the any words if they're not a lot of time to process and not shown how to do things and taught how mm-hmm. to do things they'll use those strategies to deflect and seek attention so that they don't mm-hmm. have to go and do the work like it yeah. is such mm-hmm. a common thing and then I often with that see a learning disability um, mm-hmm. tied to it and it's yeah. more of a deflection strategy Okay. But trauma first, right? Yeah. Getting 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 the student to be able to actually sit and why I was asking, do you have a special education classroom? Because you're talking mm-hmm. about transitions. How mm-hmm. do you minimize the students' transitions in the day? Mm-hmm. And and if that special education classroom, they can get lessons at a slower place. There's less students in the classroom. Um, Mm -hmm. they can actually have time to calm themselves and not be forced into keeping up with the rest of the classroom Mm -hmm. that can be helpful and then they can slowly reintegrate back in when they've developed like the skills 
-hmm. but without knowing where their lagging skills are, you're just throwing darts at a dart boy at a dart board. Yeah, that makes sense. Like you really need for this student a full picture. Yeah. I would I would be doing a cognitive academic formal formal cognitive formal academics not mm-hmm. benchmarks right not like the yeah. guy ready or aims web but i'd yeah. be doing a woodcock or a wyatt i'd be giving them the whisk for the cognitive and then oh. social emotional rating scales i'd use the bask for looking at their attention their hyperactivity somatic symptoms all of that and then later on with the connors or another executive functioning survey mm-hmm. and then also some um depression rating scales and self-harm scales for the student to complete themselves to see if there's something more emotionally going on. Yeah. And then that communication piece, speech, right? Yeah. You often forget about that. What are expressive, receptive, and whole language? What are they hearing? Like when you're talking to them, do they even understand what you're saying? And then that, so that's express, that's with receptive and then expressive. When they're asked a question, are they formulating the right thoughts, making the connections and able to express themselves? And do they have that whole language base to do so? And then the motor, looking at their fine motor, is writing difficult? Is there is there visual motor integration? How does that work? And then that sensory piece too. What is Could it be something environmental that is just setting them off? It could be as simple as the fans in a classroom. I mean, mm-hmm. you just don't know until you dig deeper. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like that information is really going to help me Yeah, try it, to be able to communicate that with, you know, my co- co-workers as well. It, it's so yeah. difficult to try to find the right strategy when you can't, yeah. you, you don't have enough data to figure mm-hmm. out what the lagging skill is and what the root cause is. Because... Mm-hmm. You got, and so what, you know, Donna's saying is that it's just getting, collecting data in a, in a very holistic way. So I don't know mm-hmm. if your team's already done that. I'm guessing he's already on an IEP if you're fall, like, if you're with him, but yeah. like, what, what is that? Maybe, maybe they've done some of these. So I would check, like, you don't want to redo, but like yeah. all those tests that Donna just like, right. Like yeah, what, are, what's been done, what hasn't been done. And if there's gaps in that, cause what, what I'm hearing, it's not working right? Like what, yeah. whatever they've, whatever they've determined and we're, we're like, keep trying to do the same thing. It's not changing the behavior. So therefore, yeah, maybe we have a wrong, we're looking at the wrong thing. Yeah. Cause the behavior has been, it's, let's say we've been in school since like the third week of August and it's been consistent. What I heard was last year, this kid did really did struggle more. So they're doing a little bit better this year, but it's it's still consistent. So I feel like our team hasn't found how to, I don't know. It's tough. It's definitely a tough one, but this has definitely helped me get more of a better understanding of like finding that data and then really putting that data together on how to fix that problem. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and then once I get that data, I look at it all as a whole. Maybe we determine the student has a significant emotional disability alongside a significant learning disability. And if they do have those behaviors, then next step, get that full evaluation. Then we Mm -hmm. use that data to develop a functional behavior assessment. And that Mm -hmm. functional behavior assessment includes observations and the data you've been collecting Mm -hmm. to come to the antecedent. What do we all believe is the antecedent based upon our data and our observations? Then from there, we develop a plan that's proactive Mm -hmm. and we're going to do this, this, this. And then if this happens, here's what we do. Mm 